Hey everyone. So today we are going to talk about a famous argument that is known as Pascal's wager. And my goal today is to give a very basic introduction of what the wager is. And then we're going to talk about three of the biggest objections to the wager and then some ways that you might reply to those objections. So let's just start with the question. Should you believe in God? Should you believe that there's a God? There's two main approaches that you can take to this question. The first is what you might call the epistemic approach. Epistemic means it has to do with knowledge, evidence, justified belief. And the epistemic approach to answer this question, it looks at evidence and arguments for and against God's existence. So, you know, there's the first cause argument, which basically says there has to be a first cause, so God exists. Um, there's the design argument, which says that the world shows different elements of design, and this supports the idea that God exists. But then there's also arguments against God's existence, such as the argument from evil. How could God be all good and all loving, but allow all the evil that we see in the world? So what the epistemic approach would do is sort of look at these kinds of arguments and kind of weigh them against each other to make a decision about whether God exists. There's a second way you might approach this question, though. Um, oh, sorry, really quickly. So the conclusion of these epistemic arguments would either be God does exist or God does not exist. Okay. The second way you might approach this question is by what's called the pragmatic approach. And instead of looking at arguments for and against God's existence, the pragmatic approach looks at gains and losses associated with believing or not believing in God. So the conclusion of the pragmatic approach, the pragmatic approach isn't trying to prove God exists or prove that God doesn't exist. The pragmatic approach is instead trying to argue that you should believe in God or you should not believe in God. Notice there's a should in there. So it's different. It's not saying that God exists. It's making a claim about what you should or shouldn't do instead. So Blaise Pascal took the pragmatic approach approach to God's existence. And he famously argued that you should believe in God because of what's commonly known as Pascal's wager. Okay, so what is Pascal's wager? Well, here is a version of Pascal's wager in sort of the most simplistic form. And I will say that this form is very simplistic, arguably even more simplistic than the version that Pascal himself defended. But I think looking at it this way is, a, is helpful to kind of get a grasp of the basic argument. Most philosophers who defend Pascal's wager think that ultimately the wager is going to have to be more complex than this. But we'll just talk about the most basic form to start off. So basically, here's the idea. There's two ways the world could be. God exists or God does not exist. And then there's two actions you can take. You can believe in God or you cannot believe in God. And if God exists and you believe in God, you get something infinitely good. You get to know God for all eternity and go to heaven. If God exists and you don't believe in God, you get something potentially infinitely bad. If you're separated from God or go to hell. And if God does not exist, then whether you believe in God or not believe in God, there might be some gains or losses associated with each of those choices, but whatever you do, the outcome is gonna be finite. So when you sort of look at this whole picture all together, um, philosophers often talk about what's called expected value. And so the expected value is what we use to make a decision if we're uncertain about some of the relevant facts. And so since we're not 100% certain that God exists or 100% certain that God doesn't exist, let's say, we can think about the expected value of each of these actions. And it looks like the expected value of believing in God is infinitely good. And the expected value of not believing in God is actually infinitely bad. Um, and a common rule that philosophers use specifically in what's called decision theory, which is basically what we're doing right now. Um, I don't have time to go into all the details of it, but I do have a longer video where I talk about decision theory. So I'll link that if you're interested. But a common rule that philosophers um, and economists and others who work in decision theory say is what you should do is pick the action that maximizes expected value. And that's basically saying from your point of view, do the thing that 
based on how good various actions would be and the probabilities you assign to various things, um, do the action that looks like it will work out the best in the long term. Um, sorry, my slides are okay. And so as long as the probability that God exists is not zero, the expected value of believing in God, according to this table, this chart, is infinite. Um, and there's good reasons to think that the probability that God exists isn't zero. Most um, people working in probability theory think that we should only assign probability zero to things like explicit contradictions. So the argument concludes maximizing, uh, sorry, believe me in God maximizes expected value. You ought to maximize expected value, so you should believe in God. So that's the most basic version of Pascal's wager. Now we're gonna talk about three objections to the wager. And this is the most common objection. It's what's called the many gods objection. And almost everyone, when you present Pascal's wager, this is one of the first things they'll say in response. And basically what the many gods objection says about the wager is the wager is just overly simple. So in our original decision matrix, we just had two possibilities, God exists or God doesn't exist. But in reality, when you kind of look at <laughs> the world religions, things are just a lot more complicated than that. And let's, this, this decision matrix on the slide is just a potential example of how this might go, but I, I picked two religions at random and you could you know, illustrate this with various types of religions, but let's just say we include two, two of religions in our decision table, this chart on the slide. Um, the Christian God exists, and the Muslim God exists. And then we're also considering the possibility that God doesn't exist. So those are sort of the three ways that the world could be. And then we see in the first column, the three actions we could take, we could believe in the Christian God, we could believe in the Muslim God or not believe in God at all. And so when you sort of make the decision table a little bit more complicated in this way, the expected values start to look a lot more confusing. So if you believe in the Christian God and the Christian God exists, you again get this infinitely good thing that we talked about. But if you believe in the Christian God and the Muslim God exists on most um, theological positions in Islam, you would not go to heaven, you would go to hell. So there's the potential for an infinitely bad thing there. And then if God doesn't exist and you believe in the Christian God, um, again, you have a finite outcome. So I'm not saying it's good or it's bad, but e either way, it's finite. Um, if you believe in the the Muslim God and the Christian God exists, again, it's not so great. But if you believe in the Muslim God and, and the Muslim God exists, then you get this infinitely good thing. So kind of similar to Christianity, but just flipped. And again, if God doesn't exist, it's finite. Um, and then if you don't believe in God and the Christian or Muslim God exists, um, you get an infinite punishment. But if God doesn't exist, there's some finite outcome. So when you look at the expected value column, um, it looks like we don't really have a reason to prefer Christianity or Islam. Um, and again, things get complicated here because we're also dealing with infinities. Um, but this is just kind of giving us a first gloss on how this objection might go. So it's basically saying Pascal's wager doesn't really give us a way to distinguish between different gods or different religions. And here's some consequences of this objection if it is successful. Um, the first consequence is that we don't really have a reason to pick one religion over the other. Christianity, Islam, and then whatever other religions we might add to the mix, at least if those religions um, have something like an infinitely good heaven, infinitely bad hell, um, those are all going to have the same expected value. So you might think, okay, 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 so maybe this doesn't let us pick between religions, but maybe we can still conclude that it's a bad idea to be an atheist. Um, you should at least practice one of these religions, because if you remember on our previous slide, atheism had two negative infinities and the other two at least gave you some possibility of getting this infinitely good thing. Okay, I don't think that that's gonna work and here's why. There is a possibility, even if it's very unlikely, that atheists actually go to heaven and theists actually go to hell. You might say that sounds super, super unlikely but again, I don't think it involves an explicit contradiction. So as long as we don't assign this possibility probability zero, we can actually alter this decision matrix that we had. We can add a column which says, you know, what about this possibility that atheists go to heaven and theists go to hell? Well, on that view, the atheist gets the infinite reward and then those practicing religions 
would get an infinite punishment. And so then it actually doesn't look like atheism is going to be a worse bet than believing a religion. So the many gods objection actually has an even worse consequence. It's not that we can't choose between religions, but it just looks like all of the choices that we have on the table seem to have the same expected value. We don't really have a way to pick between them at all. Okay, things start to, things are looking pretty bad, um, but I actually think there's a pretty good way to respond to this objection. And I'm gonna explain that using a story or what philosophers call a thought experiment. Um, and I'll explain why I think the story shows that probability matters. And I think that's the key to solving the many gods objection. So let's say you're on a game show and this is a very unique game show in that uh, let's say the host of this game show has the power to send you to heaven or not. And let's just say um, there's two doors in front of you. And, and the first, the yellow door, you have a 0.9 chance or 90% chance at going to heaven. And otherwise, if you pick that door, you'll cease to exist. Behind the second door, you have a 0.1 or a 10% chance at going to heaven. And then um, otherwise, you will cease to exist. Okay. So if we just kind of do the calculations the way we have been, where we say, well, look, either way, you kind of have a chance at heaven and you have a chance at, you know, ceasing to exist. Well, you know, uh, if we don't take the probabilities into account, it actually kind of looks like you should be indifferent between the two doors because both doors give you some chance at going to heaven. In the same way that, you know, we're saying Christianity and Islam and this weird religion where atheists go to heaven, atheists go to hell, they all give you some chance at heaven. So should we just be indifferent between all the options? And the answer is no, absolutely not. You should totally pick the door that gives you the 90% chance at going to heaven rather than the door that gives you the only the 10% chance at going to heaven. And so in the same way, when we applause to Pascal's wager, the thought is that we need to take into account the probability of each religion. We can't just say, well, there's infinities involved here, so the probabilities don't matter anymore. Um, and we just can't make any decisions, like all, all these uh, worldviews have the same expected value. No, probability still matters, even when there's infinities involved. Um, so here's how you might apply probabilities to Pascal's wager. And the main takeaway, um, to kind of put it in the simplest way possible, is that you should wager for the religion that you think is most likely to be true in the same way with our thought experiment, you should pick the door that gives you the higher chance at heaven rather than the lower chance at heaven. So that's kind of the main point, the main takeaway. Um, and I have a paper called Salvaging Pascal's Wager where I kind of explain how this works in more detail. And if you're interested in like the formal framework of like how all the infinities work and how we factor in probabilities, you should check out that paper. I'll link it in the description. Um, but the reason is because Christianity and Islam actually don't have the same expected value wagering on the religion that's more probable, whether that's Christianity or Islam or something else, that's going to give you the higher chance at getting the infinite good. And so it has a higher expected value because again, it's better to get the higher chance of the infinite good rather than the lower chance. You might say, how do we determine what religion is most likely to be true? Well, you do that by looking at evidence and arguments. So I'm not here to tell you this religion is most likely to be true. That's not part of Pascal's wager. Um, but you can use the epistemic arguments we talked about from the first slide to determine what religion is most likely to be true and then apply that to Pascal's wager. Um, however, I think most of us would agree that it's pretty unlikely that atheists and agnostics go to heaven and theists go to hell. And for this reason, what ends up coming out of Pascal's wager is that it's actually irrational to be an atheist or an agnostic. So you shouldn't be an atheist or an agnostic. You should practice the religion you think is most likely to be true, even if you think that atheism is very, very, very probable. So I think that's a pretty interesting and controversial conclusion from Pascal's wager, even if you know the wager isn't telling us what specific religion to wager on, it's still saying, atheism and agnosticism are irrational. You should be religious or practice a religion. And which one? The one you think is most probable, the one you think is most likely to be true. Okay, 
So that's the basic response to the many gods objection. We're going to talk about two more objections, but those should be more quick. The second objection is what you might call the impossibility objection. And that objection goes like this. Wagering is impossible. We can't form beliefs merely for their benefits. Um, and in other words, there's this big word philosophers use. It's called doxastic voluntarism. Doxastic voluntarism is the view that we can voluntarily control our beliefs. So we can kind of control our beliefs at will. And the objector is saying doxastic voluntarism, this view you can control your beliefs, it's false. And because it's false, wagering is impossible. And here's an example that illustrates why you might think doxastic voluntarism is false. Let's say I offer you a million dollars to believe that one plus one equals three. And let's say you really, really want the million dollars. The problem is, like the objection says, you can't form a belief merely for its benefits, right? So even if you really want the million dollars more than you care about your beliefs about this mathematical thing, um, it seems like you can't just believe one plus one equals three in order to get the money. So that's why a lot of people think doxastic voluntarism is false. And this is a problem for Pascal's wager because even if we, we should wager, um, if this objection is right, we just can't. We can't wager because we can't control our beliefs. Okay, so there's two main responses to this objection. The first response is not all beliefs are created equal. And specifically, they're not created equal when it comes to how, how much control we have over them. Um, so some things are obviously true or obviously false. One plus one equals three is obviously true. And then, you know, one plus one equals two is obviously false. I mean, sorry, I just flipped those. <laughs> one plus one equals two is obviously true. One plus one equals three is obviously false. Wow. Okay. Um, but whether God exists, it doesn't seem like it's one of those things that's like so obviously true or so obviously false, at least like one plus one equals two is or one plus one equals three is. Um, and so because it's this case where you might be kind of torn about what to believe, you might say, well, there is kind of good arguments on both sides. Um, because you're in this situation, some argue that you actually have a lot more control over your belief in theism or your religious beliefs than you have over these, you know, cases of statements that are obviously true or obviously false. Okay. And also, even if you can't control your belief as easily as you can like raise your hand or something, um, you might have indirect control over your beliefs. So you might not be able to change your political beliefs just like that, but you could maybe change them by changing the news sources you read or not going on Twitter so much or, you know, whatever. So just because we don't have direct control over something doesn't mean we don't have indirect control over it. You can, you know, indirectly control your fitness level by, uh, you know, how much you're sleeping and working out, for example. Um, so that's response one. Response two is to make Pascal's wager about action rather than about belief. And so some argue that Pascal's wager doesn't necessarily give us a reason to directly believe in God, but it gives us a reason to commit to God. Um, and this would look like, you know, going to church, praying, immersing yourself in a religious community. So doing these actions, acting as if God exists, but not trying to directly believe in God. So if you make the wager about practicing a religion or converting to a religion, rather than just believing a religion, and the, the impossibility objection doesn't come up because we do have control over actions like that. Okay, so that's the impossibility objection. Here's our final objection. And this is what's called the irrationality objection. So here's the thought. Even if it is possible to take Pascal's wager, like we just talked about, that doesn't guarantee that the beliefs that are formed from Pascal's wager would be rational at least from an epistemic point of view. Remember at the beginning, we talked about epistemic and pragmatic. So it's, it's worrying that, you know, even if, you know, yeah, there's a lot to gain, there's little to lose, it still seems like you're sacrificing something about rationality uh, and maybe epistemically or evidentially these beliefs would be irrational. Here's another way of putting it. Believing because of Pascal's wager seems like it would violate evidentialism. Evidentialism is a common view in epistemology, which says we should proportion our beliefs to the evidence. But if you're believing something because it gives you certain benefits or because you want to avoid certain negative outcomes, that doesn't seem like you're following your evidence. You're just kind of believing uh, to, to get certain goods or to avoid certain bad things. 
Okay. And it seems like a problem, especially if we want to proportion our beliefs to our evidence, right? So here's a couple of responses. Again, we'll talk about two responses. So here's the first possibility. Suppose your evidence is permissive. What it means for your evidence to be permissive is that it means you could be rational to be a theist or an atheist or an agnostic. Um, none of those would be out of bounds when it comes to rationality. So you might think for certain questions, the evidence is just really hard to evaluate. There's good evidence on both sides. You could think about two jurors and they're sitting in a courtroom and they're trying to decide whether Smith is guilty. And they've heard a lot of the evidence. Um, they've heard all the same evidence, you know, about whether, you know, eyewitness testimony and what fingerprints are where and et cetera, et cetera. And one juror says Smith is innocent and another juror says Smith is guilty. I don't think that means we should automatically conclude one of them is irrational. It might just be a complicated case and there's room for some rational disagreement when the evidence is really hard to assess. So this is what it means for your evidence to be permissive. And if your evidence for God's existence is permissive, meaning you recognize there's good arguments for and against, um, and maybe you're even like torn about what to believe, or at least you could get in a situation where you might be torn about what to believe. Um, so you would be rational as a theist or an agnostic or an atheist. Then you can take Pascal's wager and still respect evidentialism. And this is because more than one belief attitude fits your evidence. So yeah, maybe we should proportion our beliefs to the evidence, but that doesn't automatically mean that our evidence forces a certain belief attitude on us. Maybe sometimes it permits us to believe more than one thing. And then response two is similar to what we talked about with the previous objection. We can also make the wager about acting rather than about believing. And if we make the wager about committing to God or practicing a religion or converting to a religion, um, then this objection doesn't seem to apply anymore because evidentialism is about what we should believe, not about how we should act. So if the wager is about how we should act, then you can take the wager without violating evidentialism. All right, so let's talk about what we've covered today. We've talked about two approaches you might take to God's existence, the epistemic approach and the pragmatic approach. And then we've talked about a famous pragmatic approach, often known as Pascal's wager. We've discussed the question, what is Pascal's wager? And then talked about three objections to the wager, the many gods objection, the impossibility objection, and the irrationality objection. I just wanna say though, this is not the end of the story by any means. This is just a really basic introduction and I've only talked about three objections. Um, there's plenty of other objections to Pascal's wager. And then there's also replies and defenses to those objections. And I actually talk about this in some of my other videos as well. Um, I have one that's called, should you believe in God? Where I kind of go into this in more depth. That's also the one where I talk about decision theory more as well. So you might wanna check that out. But um, I have a number of videos on Pascal's wager. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot more to be said here. There's a lot more to this debate, but I think what this kind of brings up that I think is really interesting is whether, even if these epistemic arguments for God's existence aren't ultimately convincing or don't fully settle the question of whether God exists, it's interesting to think about whether we might have a reason to believe in God in any way. So I think that's kind of a cool feature, um, of Pascal's wager and something that's interesting to think about. All right. Awesome. Thanks for listening.